My name is Progeny Papa, Chair of AXO, the Association of African Exhibition Organizers. Our Agile Leadership Series has allowed us the opportunity to learn from the many leaders in our industry over the past few months. Our greatest triumphs and challenges have allowed us to engage, motivate, and support the exhibition and event industry. So today I am joined by Nelly Mukazaire, and she is the Chief Executive Officer, the CEO of the Rwanda Convention Bureau. Now, Nelly is really passionate about the African continent, and she is really passionate about the youth in particular. Um, she believes that the African continent, we need to transform the narrative for greater prosperity. Uh, she's really great with mentorship and shares her journey of overwhelming personal circumstances and her experience as a young leader in a new Rwanda and to motivate the new generation of Africans to be active leaders today. So Nelly, your CV says so much and I really hats off to you for the innovativeness in which you are inspiring the youth of Africa. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for welcoming me. And it's uh, such an honor for me to join this conversation. Thanks. Well, I know that obviously this virus has just affected all parts of the world. And um, it's wonderful to be able to chat to you, um, you know, on that side of the continent and find out how this has affected you in Rwanda and your business in Rwanda. I mean, you guys are key players within the exhibition and events industry. So what would you say has been your greatest challenge during this crisis? Thank you very much for that question. I think it's, it's first of all, a global reality. This uh, virus has uh, affected the whole world and uh, most of the challenges that uh, Rwanda faced and in particular the business event sector um, are, are over, over cross border, they are same realities all over the world. And if I would come to particularity for our context, of course, one of the first challenge was stopping business in general. <laughs> like we had uh, quite a number of events which were confirmed um, around 107 events and uh, they were most of them postponed, uh, luckily. Um, we have uh, some, most of them confirmed to happen next year, but that is a revenue that we were supposed to generate to the economy, uh, which we didn't uh, manage to. For example, we had a target of 88 um, million US dollars, but we only achieved 46. So that's pretty, uh, just um, a little bit, it's like 51%. So uh, that one speaks volume in terms of economic impact it has. Um, but again, that's a reality that I would say uh, all over the world, everybody was facing, especially um, business events because they capitalize on people traveling, on people meeting, uh, on, on people networking. So which requires uh, people to have freedom to, to move. So um, another challenge was uh, then to try and keep a positive message, especially um, to the events organizers and the different uh, players in the industry without being insensitive to the realities we were all living, a health reality is, is something of a very huge essence. And that's why even our government took uh, immediate measures in terms of protecting the people and in terms of also um, doing or taking all precautions for people's safety in priority, which of course affected business in many areas. Um, and we know from the, the world stopping the travels and then all that, so it, it affected. So it, how, how do you keep a positive message of, of giving hope to people that you will still at some time gather and meet and that you're not appearing insensitive to the fact that maybe some may even be affected health-wise or personal-wise or, or in, even in other levels. So and we worked hand in hand with our partners in the sector professional conference organizers, organizations, uh, venues to say, okay, let's stay safe and meet in the future. <laughs> Priority is, is staying safe. And there we combined efforts to work on now guidelines of safety, even in that context, how even for short meetings, whenever the economy will open, how do we keep ourselves safe? Because that's the priority. But again, try to be active in, in reinventing again or giving life back to the 
to the industry. So I would say the main first challenge was that one, um, revenues not, not generated for sure. And then economy affected across the board because uh, you know, business events or mice have really a big uh, multiplier effect. It's one of the sectors which create jobs, which uh, give uh, business to transport, business to hospitality, business to agriculture. So once that sector is affected, it goes across the board. So it was going really into so many uh, lines. So the second one was how do we stay together, um, keep hope and focus uh, on, on future, hoping for a better, better future, but also being very sensitive and, and, and real to the current context of, um, of the country. So I, I think those, those were the, the, the most challenges if, if I would limit myself there, although we, we can later discuss on what have been some of the, of the approaches or strategies we took to face those challenges. Thank you. Exactly, and that's probably my next question because having those challenges and being faced with those challenges that many countries have been faced with and many organizations that I've been chatting with, it's just interesting to see and to hear from you know, different organizations and, and what are the being challenges. And obviously for you guys, you have seen these challenges, but I know at the same time, because we're an industry that just doesn't stay still, we are constantly thinking of ways to get out of the box. And um, so what would you say, how did you as a Rwanda Convention Bureau uh, work uh, with uh, the, uh, you know, the state of the country and the state of the exhibition and events industry? Uh, and what have you done that you can say that, you know, you're really proud of you and your team for uplifting people in this way? Yeah, thank you very much. That's an interesting question. For, for the case of our country, I'll put them in three, three layers. There's the country, there's the leadership um, part, there's the industry, mm -hmm. and there's RCB as, as an institution. So for, for the country level, I would say the first thing, as I mentioned, was to immediately respond to, to the, the situation. And the government created a task force, which included different sectors, different ministries to respond to the reality, not looking at it only on the health way, but also the economic impact. For example, uh, they quickly came up with economic recovery fund, which a fund um, that the government established uh, and that all business affected by COVID-19 can have access. And some of the mostly affected businesses were hospitality and also industry uh, that are involved in events or in, in tourism um, sector, which is one of key sectors of, uh, of external revenue generation in our country. So that was a big responsiveness at the level of the leadership, but also um, taking measures that will keep containing or, or, or fighting the spread of the, of the virus. Because the, the, the sooner you fight it and contain it, the sooner you'll be able to get out of it and be able to reopen the economy. For example, the first case in Rwanda happened in March, the first case of, of COVID. And uh, we went through the different processes, I think all over the country, like total lockdown, you know, curfew and all the prevention measures that if we even still today apply, face mask, hand sanitizing, social distancing. But with, because of all those strong measures by June, we were able to reopen already some sectors of the economy, which included domestic tourism and domestic events. So that, that is something that was very, um, uh, strategic at the level of the country, because it, there are so many countries where they spend more than six months without opening any economic activity. So for us by June, at least Rwandans could uh, participate in domestic tourism. We could start having some small domestic events. And that was a, a big uplift. In addition to the economy recovery fund, that was a very big uplift. So I would say at government country level, strong measures of prevention against the COVID and also economic support to the, to the industry was very helpful. But then at the industry level, we worked hand in hand with partners, as, as I said, um, hotels, uh, professional conference organizers, event organizers and exhibition organizers, first of all, to understand together with them, how do we work with the international world to keep business around? Even though it may not be this year, 
but how do we make sure we reach out, we stay in touch, we give them possibility of when, when next it can be. And then also we tried, we used this time to do also some capacity building. We said what kind of maybe trainings online we can do in this period when we don't need to run on ground and maybe enrich our capacity and skills. And that was a very uh, positive uh, reaction and working together with the industry. And the third one I mentioned was to work on new guidelines. If we talk of social distancing, what does it mean? For example, now we know in any event in Rwanda, now you can use only 50% of the capacity of a venue. Um, if you usually host a thousand people, so for now, because we are still in, in fighting this, uh, this pandemic, you can only use 50%. Some other measures were also social distancing between tables, if you're setting theater, which is the same for exhibition, social distancing between booths, how many meters do we need to keep between one and another, and all the measures. And that's something we worked on together with them, which was like, how do we keep ourselves safe, but also be able to do business. And at the level of the Convention Bureau, which is the last one, is that we also, first of all, were active in, in, in being responsive citizens in being part of, of, of taking all those prevention measures, but also the implementation of those guidelines, uh, event guidelines, the Convention Bureau is active in that. We have focal persons on each venues, we have focal persons with all professional conference organizers, we work hand in hand with them, but we continued also bidding, we didn't stop. We continued bidding for 2021, 2022, 2025. We have a hope, of course, that at some point we will be able to overcome this pandemic and life will continue and we'll have to grab those opportunities. So as we were also doing virtual and hybrid events, taking up the advantage of the new technology uh, of doing virtual events, we did not sit and hold ourselves in hoping that we will again have in-person events because as much as we can do virtual hybrid, they can never replace the human interaction. So that's, that, those, are, those are some of the actions we've been doing to, to fight those challenges. And as, as I conclude, for example, we had one hybrid event, uh, African Green Revolution Forum in, in September. And we had uh, some delegates coming to the country. We had another um, uh, African Tourism uh, Leadership Forum. And then we had also another event uh, that give awards to renowned people in Africa mainly. It's called uh, Prix Africain de Développement. It's in French. We had 100 delegates coming to the country just last month. So we are reopening business and, and working hand in hand to make sure business goes back on track. Oh, I am so jealous, I have to say. <laughs> I am so, so jealous. Join us. I wish I know, I think I should be coming over onto that side. <laughs> yeah. uh, was the expansion of your numbers, Nettie, in terms of, I know you said, so the government is giving you 50% venue capacity. Um, was that something as an industry that you were asking for or was that government led? Was that their decision? It was led by industry because um, yeah. the, the industry was given the, the, the leeway to sit and we see what works in terms of allowing people to have business, but also putting safety and security, health security of people as a priority. So those will be changing. For example, by June, July, we were only using 30 capacity of 30% of the capacity. Now we've gone to 50%. Because if you need to check the health, uh, social distancing, you need to avoid crowds and it goes in numbers. And also sometimes the defer, if it's a, an exhibition of what, or what we call mice events and social gathering. You know, social gathering yeah. is something else. People are drinking, hugging, partying. Socializing. So how do you make sure you balance that? Uh, while when it's a business event, it's more of, of business. So also the setup and flexibility is different. And that's the particularity of our leadership is that uh, they always give leeway to the industry to come up with solutions that are, that are speaking to their context but with the level of responsibility about the reality everyone is facing. Of course, and I commend your leadership for that. I think that is a battle that we're struggling to uh, at this point in time because we're only allowed 250 maximum indoors, irrespective of venue size. Oh, 
Yes, and that's obviously, as you know, but just not financially feasible, right? I mean, um, to have 250 people in a venue that's 5,000 square meters or 10,000 square meters is just not financially feasible. But we are still fighting the fight. Um, like you're saying, you know, we're a very responsible industry. We're not, a, we're not there for socializing. We're there to do business, right? Mm -hmm. And green business. It's business events. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it's not people coming to party and, you know, so there's obviously, I think this, it's important to have risk categorization of events um, so that government realize that, you know, there's no blanket understanding that all events need to be 50% capacity, depending on the type of event that it is. Um, now, given that you, you've had such wonderful support by the looks of things. And, and like I said, we are so jealous on this side. Um, but obviously things can change and the environment can change. And we know how, un how much of uncertainty there is uh, with this virus uh, and as it mutates into something else uh, and there's so many fears. Um, how have you, as a convention bureau, how, what are you doing to handle scenario planning uh, for the industry? Thank you. Uh, I think that's a pertinent question. Um, and it's an evolving one, as you've said, because realities change uh, every day and people learn from what is happening. But I'd, I'd say that some of the key um, lessons that we, we would take forward as we do um, planning was one, one of course, um, trying to seize the opportunities that are coming because it helped us, for example, the whole situation to realize how much strength uh, we can use into uh, using virtual conferencing. Um, it's something we had not explored uh, sufficiently in the past. And now we believe that even withholding in-person events, you can still reach out to more and to the wider world when you add a component of virtual. Because at no point in time, everybody will be able to travel even when we open. So it opened our eyes in terms of saying, maybe in the past we targeted 10,000 people to come in the country, but there was a hundred million who could have also followed virtually. So that is one of the things that we, we've taken forward in terms of how we look at events we attract and events we going to have or exhibition we attract or even, so how do we now have that perspective of in-person versus also virtual? We saw that it's possible to have virtual exhibitions uh, to be quite honest, it's not an area we had so much explored in the past. Although in terms of income generation, it's not revenue generation is not the same because when you have people in your country, they visit, they even do more than just attending the, the exhibition. But in terms of pushing the message, the virtual aspect still counts. So the second thing is really adaptability, is really to see all the strategies we've, we've do, been doing, how do we make sure in the future they leave a, le a leeway of, of adaptability, <laughs> which was not the case. Uh, for example, from March, business was dead completely. So if you had targeted 88 million, you have hardly uh, half of it. Uh, how were our plans had ever envisioned such a situation? We had never looked at that. But I believe now it's something that people will always have as scenario. In, in the planning. But again, the third one I see is partnership and collaboration. If there's one thing we've also learned here is that if we combine effort and work in partnership, then we are able not only to recover fast from, from the situation or the reality that is affecting all of us, but we are also even able to seize multiple opportunities which we can share. So that's very applicable to us as RSTV with our partners in the industry, but also globally. If we talk of this axle, so how do we, do we now start thinking in a way we combine efforts in everything we are looking for and see how much we make sure if it's working here, it will be able to work there because challenges we've set first, first here are shared and people are learning from them and preparing ahead of them to make sure it works. Because it goes without saying that this is one of the sectors that was very affected and will still be affected for quite some time. Uh, given also, it, it's a bit different from just a meeting or conference because the, the exhibition uh, part and event part uh, has its own component of, of you need partners in it. 
uh, you moving not only people, but also equipment, skills, uh, and all that together. So it requires a, a high level of really collaboration and, and, and partnership. So I would say those are some of the aspects we've now made priority. Last one is to acknowledge the, the power of domestic um, events or domestic tourism. We saw a, 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 an uplift from really the fall down we had had in tourism from domestic tourism. In the past, we had not really capitalized on it, but this reality or this situation made us realize how much it has potential. And now we are looking at it beyond just tourism, but also events. How do we come up with homegrown events? And if I talk of homegrown, it's not only Rwanda, but maybe region grown events, African grown events, or area by area. Like, how do we start creating and coming up with things that will speak to our context, our vision, and then will even be more um, selling themselves, attractive, not only to the external world, but even starting with your, your, your current place, your country or your region. Yeah, so those, those, those are the four pillars I would say that uh, are shaping our way we plan and strategize uh, for this sector in the future. Exactly. And I think I think that what you're saying is just so important is to look at it holistically. And I think using those pillars to guide you in your actions, give guidance to your team as well, and give guidance to the industry that, you know, to, to relook at the way you're doing business. And I think that will help you in terms of uh, how you move forward. But now doing all these things and planning for all these scenarios, how would you say, or what would you say are certain things in terms of the way you're doing business now that will remain after the pandemic? Because, you know, there's this perception, of course, that, well, you know, this is for many leaders or many businesses, they, you know, somehow we see this as a temporary situation and that once the pandemic is over, you know, we'll all be back to normal. But we know that that normal is going to take a while. Um, and what are some of these uh, thoughts that you have now, the ways forward that you're projecting that will stay uh, consistently going forward? I think, um, as I mentioned, one is, is really um, forward planning in terms of adaptability yeah. on some of the situations that may be beyond your control. <laughs> But also efficiency in a way in a way we do business. I, I must admit personally, I found a lot of efficiency in using technology. If there's one thing that came out into this uh, whole pandemic reality is the use of technology. So let's say, for example, now in our country, we pay everything electronically. Before the pandemic, it wasn't that case. You'd still want to have some cash, you know, you still feel like. I have to have money. How, how do I work without having money in my wallet? But today we have um, mobile money paying. You use your immediate phone you pay. We use ATM, we use um, transfers. So today really uh, what you use of uh, technology has gone up to another level. And I think that's something good we should keep because that is even one of our, our vision. We want to become a technology hub as a country in, in the region, even globally. So being advanced in how we use technology is, is something very significant. Um, secondly, we don't have now to do everyday uh, in-person meetings, although sometimes they're good, especially if you want to break a deal. You, you need to have that handshake, although we, we no longer allow the handshake, but still we can discuss now. We, we, we are having this interview. There's so many things that can happen online, We've now been having our senior management meetings, board meetings, and decisions are taken. Not years ago, we were feeling like a board meeting. Everybody has to be seated around that round table for decisions to be taken. You know, signing things, you need to have your file and have every document you put your own signature. But now we are using electronic signature. So those are some of practical examples that show that the use of technology is something that is going to be very, very key to carry forward. Uh, and, and then also the adaptability and flexibility, but also thinking out of out, out box. Uh, I'll give an example. We had uh, industries here um, manufacturing clothes, just clothes, but with the COVID, they even realized they can manufacture uh, face masks. 
Some were just manufacturing um, a product, sanitary product. They realized they can do hand sanitizers. They realized they can do so. It also opened in, in rooms in terms of realizing actually we can do more and we can respond to the market even more. Because um, it wouldn't be something you think about if you're just supposed to do uh, cloth. And then why would I even start thinking of all these PPEs and all these protection things? So I, I think even that's applicable to RCB. How do we adapt our plans to the reality with the room of evolving? Use of technology is going to be something we carry forward, but also thinking other ways, thinking other business opportunities, thinking other events that speak to, to, to the strategic sectors of, of, of your, your area. So, so those, are, those are some of the things I think we will carry. And um, for the rest, I think the, the mask and uh, social distancing, I hope this will end very, very soon. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree yeah. more. But you know, you're so right about the efficiencies. Um, it allows us, uh, it, it, we allowed, we, more time um, because of technology it has made us more efficient it saves us the hassle of going out and having to stand in queues and driving to meetings uh, you can get so much more done in your day uh, than you've ever done before and for anybody that was feeling a little bit left behind you have no choice now um, but to jump on <laughs> yeah <laughs> but to jump on. Now, we, I know you talked briefly um, earlier about virtual events and virtual exhibitions and things like that. Um, what would you say is, uh, would be some of the challenges of uh, virtual events? You know, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to go virtual? Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think one, well, first thing is, is really having the right technology. Uh, uh, because if, if you not, do not have the right platforms, the right skills to really do a platform that is viable in terms of image, message, and then security, we, we've had uh, experiences where you start a webinar conference and then hacking is going through and then it becomes um, an issue. So I think it's very key. Any advice would be um, get the right technology, get the right skills, get the right platform. So, and and that is the beauty of that. That is a that is a new startup um, opportunities. A lot of young people are now coming up with applications and platforms to respond to that. So the the right platform is very key. Secondly, you really have to have an engaging program when you go into a program. It needs to be right on the point because people's attention and focus when it's virtual is really um, limited. And you've, you've seen also in some of the realities, more than an hour, you've already gone on another call. <laughs> you're, you're just there without being there. They just see your image, you're not there. So it's important to make sure your program or whatever conference or whatever you're doing is right on the point and you're maximizing people's presence in terms of capturing their attention. So short, precise, and engaging. Another aspect is also how do you play? Because virtual is, is so much visual and, and you need to see how do you drive content in a less word, but more of visual things. And, and that attracts, um, attracts attention and makes people um, interact better or be able to respond quickly on the, on the different things. Um, but again, also trying to see um, how you segment the people you want to have on a certain virtual conference. Because the more you may have different um, people from different sectors, different background, the more it may be difficult to, to put their attention and to really be relevant to each of the sectors. So it, it requires segmentation, a bit more of segmentation than when you're doing in person um, or in presence uh, uh, one. So I, I think um, it's, 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 those are some of the key, the key areas I would, I would advise one when it comes to virtual or maybe hybrid events. Um, that's one of the key lessons we've learned uh, from this. And do you think that, that this hybrid, this notion of hybrid events um, 
uh, will continue well into the future and would benefit our industry? Well, I think it would be a little bit early to, to judge because until end of this year, it, it, it's hard to be able to know, but we can see reality is that the first six months of next year will still be living into that. Yes. And, and I think that's what we'll be able to assess if it is something that is really being beneficial or not. Otherwise now it's like we have no choice. So it would be interesting to see how it works when we have a choice, when we have That's actually true. chosen to do that approach and see. Otherwise, I guess now it would be early to, to really be able to assess the impact. But mm -hmm. I think the aspect of um, um, reaching out to many, uh, giving access to more uh, is, is quite interesting in that perspective. But how beneficial it's going to be, how practical and uh, sustainable, that's something we can only assess when we've been in that um, deliberately, trying the, those uh, those aspects. Yes, agree. I like that. You know, giving access to many, yeah, and seeing how they respond. Um, and 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 you're right. You know, once we are able to uh, go on like we normally do, and and just thrive in the face-to-face -face events that we we normally host. Uh, and if you're giving the opportunity to go to attend virtually, it would be interesting to see what our numbers are like, um, right? Because also going virtually and hosting hybrid events is an additional cost that we will have to incur as well. Yeah. That's why we'll only be able to assess the cost and benefit analysis once we are into it, because everything goes with a cost. And the reality of our business event or MICE is that we also want to have the delegate spending. So how much do we strategize to get virtually the delegate spending that will make a business case to continue that approach? I think it's something we'll have to assess uh, in the future. Definitely. Yeah. Now, on a personal note, I have to ask you, amidst trying to get the industry back together and you know keep the Convention Bureau go going and supporting uh, the industry, how do you keep motivated during all of this insanity that's around us? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think the first motivation is, is family moment, to be quite honest. Family moment, I am um, I'm a married woman with two kids, 12 and nine. So um, seeing them, having a moment with them, living. So it's, it's, it's motivating a lot. The second one is also, um, to be quite honest, having um, a team that you feel like when you call their rounds and that you're also being relevant to, to them in what they need to do. So it, it, keeps, it keeps also motivating because you wake up in the morning feeling like, okay, we've got this one again, thank God we are alive. Thanks for another day. So let's get maximum of it. You don't feel drained that Ah, again, I'm going to meet these people. Ah, you're just excited. Okay, this is it. Third one, I do a lot of sports. I like workout. Yeah. So that is also one of the things that uh, keeps me uh, motivated. Um, I feel it's not only a physical push, but it's also a mental push. It's also confidence. It's also discipline. It's, you know, like feeling good with yourself. Uh, with what you have failed yesterday, but you're able to do today. It speaks a lot, even in how you're approaching everything, every every day's duty. Agreed. Okay. It's that rush of those endorphins, right? <laughs> that the exercise releases. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, and, and you're right. You're so right. It's so important to create that balance. Um, you've got your family at home and you've got your family at work, uh, like you say. And because they become your family, you are excited to work with them. You work together and I think having, I love that balance that you've created. And I think it's important for all leaders to be able to do that the same because sometimes it can be a very lonely position to be in. Yep. So what advice finally would you give to other leaders in our industry currently? Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I find that a little bit, uh, I would, I would speak of it in a modest way because myself, I still need <laughs> advice to know how we get out of this situation. But I would just modestly share, uh, yes, some of the, the things I've, I've, I've tried or we've tried with the team and the industry. 
that I've seen working is, is, is really first partnership and collaboration within the different partners. That is something I will clearly say um, it works. Maybe we speak of it many times, but in this time, it's even more needed and it's even more strategic because this is one of those times where people need to join hands and combine effort, um, whether it's skills, whether it's financial effort, whether it's opportunities to really maximize. Because it's, it's like when you need to come from a big hole, then it's always needs one to pull the other and another one to pull another and another one to pull another. So I, I, that, that will be the first one. Um, and then second one is, is to get open to the, re, the, the reality, being flexible that we may not be able to achieve as much we, we want, we've planned or wanted to achieve. We don't have to take it personal in terms of feeling that, uh, that we, we've not been able to do, but we also have to take it responsibly, like in a way of saying, okay, so now that this has happened, how do we respond to this? How do we fill that gap? We don't sleep at it, but we, try to get a solution for now and for the future. And then, then um, lastly, it's important to take care of oneself. Uh, I, I'd say um, COVID reality and all that goes with it uh, had not affected only economies, it has affected us, all of us as individuals, as human beings, individually, family, community, countries. So it's also important to not ignore it but I'd rather embrace it and accept how it may have affected you, um, even mentally, even um, uh, really physically and in different ways, and then evolve with it, Re respond to it with a positive mind, but also really taking care of ourselves and knowing that we, we are human beings at the end of the day. I couldn't agree more. That is wonderful advice. And I know we're all as leaders, I think we all feel that we need help. Uh, our situations are unique, but I think each story that we share and each story that we've shared on this platform from the different leaders and the different challenges that we all face, um, I think somebody else is learning um, from, from you at the same time. And I think that we are so appreciative of that. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. Nelly, thank you for your time today. I think uh, it's been really, really valuable insights uh, into you as an individual and getting to know you and business in Rwanda Convention Bureau and the exhibition and in events industry at large. We really, really appreciate your time and your insight today. Um, and we hope to continue the conversation with you. Like you said, uh, it's all about partnerships and collaboration, right? Thank you very much also for inviting me and giving me all this time. And really, we appreciate the, the partnership with AXO and we look forward to getting the maximum and also being able to share whatever we can share so that it's a win-win uh, situation. Absolutely. And, and that's it. I think what this time has offered us is to have time to get to know each other, to get to know, uh, you know what's happening within the continent and yeah. to work together and to share each other's stories and uh, to get access to uh, people that we don't normally chat to. And, and that opens so many new doors. And I think that's what this year is all about. Yes. So yeah, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Yes, and uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, to everybody that's been listening in, thank you so much for joining us. We sure that you're going to catch up on the rest of the Agile Leadership Series. Um, they're all on our AXA YouTube page. We've conducted many interviews and we're sure that you will find some inspiration, support and motivation in your journey ahead. I'm Progeny Packer, Chairperson of AXA.